John chapter 3, verse 22. Now, as John chapter 3 comes to a close, we return to the other of the two main characters so far in the Gospel of John. So we return our focus back now to John the Baptist. And this time, Jesus and his disciples are out in the wilderness somewhere along the Jordan baptizing as well. And a conversation gets started among John the Baptist's disciples and some others who were there with him about Jesus versus John the Baptist. What does John the Baptist think about this Jesus and his disciples now out in the wilderness baptizing people, doing what he has been doing, what he and his disciples have been doing. Now, this other guy, this upstart, and his disciples are doing the same thing, and they're gathering crowds around them. What does John the Baptist think about that? As he is confronted with that, John the Baptist's response helps us see again his character and his perspective on all of these things, and we like him even more. John the Baptist is going to talk about his role as a minister, as a forerunner to Jesus, to the Messiah who is coming. Then John the Baptist is going to talk even more about the importance of Jesus. John the Baptist is always pointing the way to Jesus Christ. So the structure of our passage this morning is a little bit like this. First of all, we actually get to talk about baptism. That's how the passage opens. It was actually important enough inside of that culture, inside of the kinds of things that Jesus wanted to teach his disciples, it was important enough for him and for his disciples to baptize people. So what did it mean to them? What then does it mean to the church as they continue in the pattern that Jesus gave them before he ascended into heaven? So we get to talk a little bit about baptism. We're also going to talk about how John talks about John. The kind of question that John is asked can provoke one of two responses, a response of envy or a response of humility. And John's answer, again, helps us see not just his place in the kingdom of God, but our place as followers of Jesus Christ. So John talks about John, and then John talks about Jesus. Then John the Baptist moves specifically to the topic of who Jesus is. And again, we are not at all surprised. We've seen this a little bit with John so far. We've made a big deal of this because this is just what happens when we read about John the Baptist. The more we read about John the Baptist, the more we learn about Jesus Christ. The more we fall in love with him, the more we get to know who Jesus is. So let's open up our passage, John chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. It goes like this. After Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salem because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put into prison. This is part of the rest of the arc of the life of John the Baptist. But John the disciple is telling us he isn't, that hasn't yet happened to him, so he is still out there baptizing. So Jesus and his disciples go out into the countryside and they begin baptizing not far from where John and his disciples are as well. John the Baptist has been out in the wilderness. He's been usually east of the Jordan or somewhere along the Jordan River where many could come and hear him preach and then be baptized. So now Jesus and his disciples are doing the same. Now John has been baptizing as we have seen so far in the gospel. John has been baptizing to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah, for the coming of Jesus Christ. And so now the Messiah has come. And he's gathered a few disciples among him, and he's beginning to teach, and he's beginning to talk about who he is. And now Jesus and his disciples are baptizing as well. So this is important. Baptism isn't just something that belongs to some version of a religious rite 
that was performed by a group of unusually pious Jews, and that's something that happened 2,000 years ago. There are actually a few groups among the Jewish community during the days of Jesus and John the Baptist who were known for their zeal, who were known for um, how much they separated from the rest of the world and devoted their lives to their God. One of those groups were called the Essenes, and one of the things we know about them is that they practiced the rite of baptism that those who became a member of their group, they'd be baptized. And it's the symbol of an old life and a new life, and they would do that. But Jesus now is baptizing. It's not just John the Baptist. It's Jesus now who's baptizing as well. So it's not just something that belongs to a particularly pious group of individuals. It's something that Christ intends for all of his followers and his disciples. In fact, not only does Jesus baptize, Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist. He goes through it to lead us then through it. And then he baptizes to teach his disciples and the rest of the church. This is something that we do. This is an important part of who we are. Another verse from here, just right past where we quit reading, it's actually called a rite of purification. And it really is seen both by them and it's how it's given to us In the rest of the New Testament, it really is seen as symbolic of a brand new life where sin is put behind us and a new life is in front of us. Paul the Apostle is going to use the image of being baptized into death and raised into a brand new life. This is the reason we go all the way under. So if you're getting baptized this morning and you didn't know you were going all the way under, you're going all the way under. And we raise to a brand new life. This is part of the beauty of baptism. And we do it in front of brothers and sisters in Christ. We do it in front of the rest of the world. And we say, I belong to Jesus. I am his child. This is now the new life that I have. The New Testament church actually makes this act of baptism important to us from the very beginning. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit has fallen upon the church. Peter gets up and preaches. They've been speaking in other tongues. And as Peter preaches, thousands of people are added to the church in one day. It's an amazing day. But as people respond to all of this, here's part of what happens in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They've heard the message of Jesus. It has struck them in an important way, and now they want to know what to do next. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That kind of pattern is is hinted at in John chapter 3 and explained in its fullness later on as the gospel continues. Jesus even tells his disciples, make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And don't forget, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So this act of baptism is important for us. It's crucial for us. Baptism doesn't save us. It isn't the act of salvation, but it is what saved people do. This is the new life I've been given, and I want to tell everybody about it. So John the disciple, as he records this, he wants us, and we've heard this language a lot already, he wants us to believe in Jesus and receive eternal eternal life as a result. He also makes it clear that the public confession of our faith is critical. And here it is, the act of baptism. And for the Christian, the follower of Jesus Christ, now it reminds us that we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us. He is this power for our brand new way of life, and he is the seal, the guarantee of our eternity with Christ forever. So all of these magnificent things are wrapped up in this act of baptism and we celebrate it together and we enjoy it together and we encourage each other through the act of baptism. Jesus and his disciples are doing it. John and his disciples have been doing it. 
But now an interesting conversation gets started. It's a very human conversation. It's a very normal, expected human conversation. So the passage continues, John chapter 3, beginning in verse 25. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. He's getting bigger crowds than you are, John. What do you think? So John answers, we need to up our media game, guys. (laughs) It's not what he says. And John answered, now listen to this. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. So a discussion arose. A few of them begin to argue about purification. Who gets to do it? what it is. We've already heard from the Jewish leaders that they don't believe that Jesus has the right kind of credentials to do these kinds of things. We've already learned that for a while now, John the Baptist has been in the pattern of doing this. Large groups of people coming out into the wilderness to hear this interesting guy preach repentance and baptize. And now all of a sudden, these crowds are moving from John the Baptist to Jesus Christ. So these very normal human disciples and another Jew that they're talking with begin to discuss what is going on here. (laughs) And the heart of the argument, the heart of the concern is very typical of human beings. The other guy is now doing what you are known for doing, and a lot of people are now going to him, what do you think? How is this going to work out now? That kind of question is tailor-made to draw out a person's character. It's tailor-made to do that, to pull out of us what is just sort of our knee-jerk response to something like this. It can easily provoke envy. More are listening to him than are listening to me. Or it can even produce humility. It can provoke humility. So which is it going to do? Now, the form of John the Baptist's humility is theological. He immediately goes to how God governs humanity. It's a magnificent response. So the very first thing that John says is, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. John's basic answer actually helps us see something very powerful about our lives with God. It is all him in the first place. The crowds that had gathered around John the Baptist, John the Baptist does not see that as I was so great, I was so interesting, I did things so well that everybody told their friends and they just kept coming. That's not how John the Baptist sees it. He sees it as this is what God gave me to this point and this is now what God is doing with Jesus. Not even a single thing that I have been given has come from me. It has all come from God. All that I have is given by him All that I don't have is also in his control. This is what we mean when we talk about a sovereign God. You see, friends, the ruler of the universe, the one who holds the spinning galaxies and stars in his hand, who erected the laws of motion that make all of that happen, The one who governs the universe also governs my life. 
when we speak of the sovereignty of God, we see that he alone is king. He alone is the ruler. He is sovereign. We can even use a word like the providence of God. It's another one of those theological terms we use from time to time. When we speak of his providence, we speak of the way in which he rules, the things that he does. In his sovereignty, God rules in a certain way. And what we want, whether we know it or not, what we want is a wise and powerful and sovereign God. We really don't want a king who can be swayed by another person. Another person in their fear or brokenness or envy says, God, I want what they have. I need you to give me what they have. And, and God sort of lives by the rule, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So, okay, I'll give you what you want. I'll take it from another. That's not the God that we want. That is a capricious God. That is a God that we cannot anticipate. It's not a God that we can take rest and comfort in. What we want is a sovereign, all-wise God. That's the God that John the Baptist follows. There's not a single thing that I have that hasn't been given by God. So what he's laid before me is what God wants laid before me. It reminds me of this incredible passage of Scripture right at the beginning of an incredible book in the Bible. But the story of Job... With everything that goes on inside of that first chapter, just about everything is taken away from Job. And it's not because he's sinned. It's not because he's unrighteous. There's something else going on inside of that book. Job's first response. In chapter 1, verse 21, the last part of that verse, he just says this. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What do you think, John the Baptist? You're becoming less and less. He's becoming more and more. John says that's exactly how it's supposed to be. You see, the argument that was brought to John the Baptist was us versus him. John's response is, well, it's all God in the first place, and I am content. The argument brought to him was us versus him. He says, it's all God anyway, and I personally am content. One commentator put it like this, thinking about this passage of Scripture. The best antidote to envy is the conviction of the sovereignty of God. Envy is the vice wherein I am wrapped up in the belief that I deserve what someone else has. That's envy. Our culture runs on the gas of envy right now. John the Baptist teaches us that the best antidote to envy is the conviction of the sovereignty of God inside of our lives. It can't be me versus God. It was all God to begin with. And beyond that, <laughs> John the Baptist actually begins to speak in terms of joy. He says, friends, there's rejoicing in this. Let me try to explain to you how this joy works. So here's what he says. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I have said I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. I'm the one who points to him. The one, and he goes into this metaphor of marriage. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is complete. This marriage metaphor, this wedding metaphor is beautiful. Christ is the bridegroom. The church is his bride. Those who believe in him and then receive eternal life become the bride of Christ. And that image comes back later in the New Testament as well. Christ the bridegroom. The church is the bride. And John the Baptist says, look, the role of the friend is to rejoice when you see those two put together. The way that John the Baptist speaks of being the friend in this context is the way of talking about being the best man or the maid of honor. 
Your job is to stand there and support and rejoice at the moment of this union and marriage. So that's where John the Baptist puts himself. He says, look, guys, this is my role, is to put these two together and to rejoice when I hear their voices with one another. Isn't that beautiful? Part of our job, part of our joy in this world is to find those who begin to hear the voice of Jesus Christ and respond and believe and receive eternal life. And then our joy is overflowing and our joy is complete. So then we are not surprised if we've understood this and absorbed this. We're not surprised that then John the Baptist says the one thing that stops me every single time I read through this passage of Scripture. He must increase and I must decrease. So let's look at this again. The conversation so far has gone from us versus him to John the Baptist saying, it's all God and I am content. And now the next step in this conversation is they need more of him anyway. That's what they need is more of him. I think this kind of belief needs to be at the very heart of absolutely every follower of Jesus Christ. And when we say something like this, when this becomes a part of who we are in a relationship with Christ, it does not mean the end of us. It does not mean that we disappear and become meaningless. It does not mean that our labor ceases here on earth. It does mean the end of my self-importance. It does mean the end of our striving after everything this world says is important. I have found the one thing that is more important than everything else, including me. I have to decrease because he needs to increase. Listen again to this truth that we've discovered about John the Baptist. The more we listen to him talk, the more we love Jesus Christ. How much of that can be said about us as individuals, about us as a church. Hang on to this thought, because I want to make sure we come back to it. Let's listen to the next section of the end of John chapter 3, because the conversation continues. John continues to describe what's going on here. So in verse 31, it goes like this. He who comes from above is above all. And John has said something like this before. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives this testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the word of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. And here it is again, both from John the Gospel writer and John the Baptist, we want to make sure that you know that it is Jesus who is important. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. This is the second time in John chapter 3 that that very topic has come to the surface in these conversations. But he who comes from above is above all. The Father loves the Son and has given him the Spirit without measure. The one who knows the things of God is the one who speaks the things of God. Now, when the disciples and that Jew first came to John with this argument, John first talked about who he was. John talked about John. Now, John moves to the next step and he begins to talk about Jesus and who Jesus is. Jesus is God. This man baptizing in the wilderness is not just some other upstart rabbi. He is God and all things belong to him. This kind of move, I think, is critical, not just inside of our lives, but for every sermon for every church, for the kind of influence that the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to have in the world around us. 
Whatever you do, make sure that people leave in awe of Jesus Christ. This is my fundamental philosophy of how sermons work. With everything that's said and the kinds of things that we talk about and the different emphases that are inside of every series or passage or sermon, I believe that there is a two-step process, okay? So when you go and you listen to other preachers online, you have this two-step process in mind because I'm right and most of them are wrong. No, you, again, you've got to hear my sense of humor in these things. But listen, this is important. Make sure people understand what the Word of God says, step one. Step two, make sure people are in awe of Jesus Christ when they leave. Point to Jesus, point to Jesus, point to Jesus, point to Jesus. This is where so many popular preachers go wrong. They leave you in awe of yourself and of your potential if only you had enough faith to get what you needed. And this is actually where self-help gets everything wrong. I am not the solution to my problems. In fact, I probably caused most of my problems. Jesus is the only solution. He is the only Savior. So John keeps talking about, listen, what I have to say the best that I can do is point to Jesus and talk about who he is. He's the one who has come from heaven. And so when we hear what he has to say, we're listening to the voice of God. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. He's the second member of the Trinity. And then he says, but no one has listened to him. This is extreme language to make sure that we get the sense that very few are listening to Jesus. So John says, I have to keep pointing in his direction. We have to keep following him. We have to keep listening because very few are listening to Jesus. In fact, enough people are going to reject Jesus while he is here on earth to turn the crowds against him, to manipulate the politics enough to make Pilate actually allow him to be crucified. This is something that we'll see throughout the Gospel of John, and we're going to come back to it from time to time because it's the way Jesus talks about his path to the cross. Jesus' path to glory is surprising. When he speaks of being lifted up and glorified, he's speaking of the cross. What happens with Jesus during his life, just even physically, is interesting. Jesus doesn't suddenly gather a group of disciples in a sizable enough group and then move himself to Jerusalem and spend all of the rest of his time in the city of Jerusalem to make sure that he influences the influencers of culture and gathers as many people as possible. Jesus spends most of his time outside of the big city, outside of cultural's, uh, culture's influencers. And when he finally is lifted up, it's on a cross and not on a platform. So then as we follow Jesus, as the church follows Jesus, we can't be too surprised if often the voice of the church is the minority report. It's the voice that sort of fits into this corner of here and isn't always heard the way that we think it needs to be heard. So if we don't have the ears of those who influence and change and fix culture, so to speak, we shouldn't be that surprised. But listen, even if the voice of the church is a minority report, it always has to be the prophetic voice. It always has to be the voice of the truth. It always has to be the voice of John the Baptist. We are those who cry out, under the, cry out in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. He's coming. He's coming. But then there is always this, he says something interesting as he talks there's always this living witness to the truth of the gospel. Listen to what he says here. Let me find the right verse. Verse 33. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. That's an interesting way of putting this. Anyone who follows Jesus is a living declaration that God exists and that Jesus is his son. So if you do receive his testimony, you become this living, walking seal that what God has said is actually true. So it's a little bit like this. The question is asked, does God exist? 
can we answer with, look at the church, look at me? Is that an answer to the question, does God exist? This is what John the Baptist is saying. If you accept his testimony, you are a seal. This is all true. So listen, the Christian follows Jesus because we know him to be true. Not just because we think something feels right to us, but because we know him to be true. The gospel is true. He is the only way to eternal life. He alone is God. So now our lives become these walking billboards for that belief, unless they aren't. I keep reading these kinds of stats. I've been reading them for a while now and they've popped back up again. These studies keep being done because of everything that has happened since spring of 2020. A lot of people are asking these questions about Christians and their church attendance and their attachment to their belief. It turns out that a shocking number of Christians have decided in the last 15 months the church just isn't worth their time. Just isn't worth their time. Pew Research, a major international research organization, came out with some results just a couple of weeks ago. In the first few months, now listen to this, in the first few months of 2021, less than half of regular churchgoers in the U.S. went to church at all. So these are people who before the COVID pandemic would have said, I go to church at least once a month. That's what's considered in these studies a regular churchgoer. They redid that study in the first few months of 2020, 2021. Less than half of those people went to church at all. Barna has been keeping track of this as well, another gigantic research organization. Since April of 2020, so this goes back to, you know, those 15 months or so, at least, you just put all that time together, at least 25% of those who attended church regularly before April of 2020 have not darkened the doorstep of a church or watched one online. 25%. Are we now inching toward 50%? If you accept the testimony of Jesus Christ, you become the seal that this is true. Unless you've decided, and it's not really all that important. See, the life of the believer is just different. We think things like this. I don't care what the cultural trends are. I don't care. I don't care how comfortable I have become going to work from home. The family of God matters and my life, my physical walking around decision-making priority kind of life needs to be a walking testimony to the truth of Jesus Christ. It has to be. So what's happening to the church? For he whom God has sent, John goes on to say, utters the words of God. For God has given the spirit to him. That's the sense of this language in verse 34. For God has given the spirit to him, Jesus, without measure. For the father loves the son and has given all things into his hands. God gives Jesus the spirit without measure. And then what happens throughout the gospel of John is Jesus says, look, in a little while I'm going to be gone, but don't worry. You're not going to be left as orphans. I'm going to give you what I've been given. I'm going to give you the very spirit of God. And he will become your comforter and he will become your guide. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. That is now the member of the Trinity who lives and abides and works inside of us in this room right now. It's the Holy Spirit of God. So God loves the Son and gives. We heard that last week. The Son loves the church and the Son gives. The Son gives the Holy Spirit. And then this language is great in verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Part of this vocabulary we know already. We've been digging through the first three chapters of this gospel. And we've heard this vocabulary 
of belief. And now John adds the, car, the, the vocabulary of obedience as well. So this is an interesting thought. And again, it is something that the rest of this gospel unpack for us, but I want to make sure we hear it because it's important to John the Baptist here and now. Unbelief, excuse me, trust in Jesus will manifest in obedience. If you believe in Jesus Christ, we will obey him. We will listen to him. We will do what he's told us to do. Here's this passage from Matthew. The last thing that Jesus tells to his disciples in that gospel, he says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you. It's not just make sure they believe and sign a card, we'll add it up, and in the end, we're just going to rejoice at everybody who shows up in heaven. Make disciples, people who are now living billboards about the truth of Jesus Christ. John, the gospel writer, says this later on when he writes 1 John, 1 John chapter 5. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. This is how we know that we love each other. We keep his commandments. Here's how we know that the love of God is at work within us. We keep his commandments. And by the way, it's not burdensome. It's actually life. This is part of what's been gotten to, through to us over and over again. So here Jesus clarifies again that belief and obedience are two steps in the same dance. One leaves, leads to the other. Otherwise, we're not doing the same dance. I trust in Jesus and I obey. So the flip side of that coin is unbelief is ultimately defiance against the offer of life. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. But again, and I want to come back to this because I want to make sure that this is the phrase that rings in our souls this week. If we have John the Baptist's perspective, this doesn't bother us, this doesn't surprise us. It does not offend our sense of self-worth or autonomy or authenticity. He must increase and I must decrease. There is no biblical character who encountered God and walked away saying, the world needs more of me and less of him. Think about that for a second. Not a single biblical character encountered God and thought, well, that was nice. I'm better. An encounter with God forces that sense of now he is so much more than I am. And now my role is to talk about him. None of those biblical characters, none of those people in the history of the church None of those people that we know who fall into this kind of category became meaningless people who were kept from fulfilling their authentic selves when they decided that Jesus was so much more than they were. This is not the kind of thing that Eeyore says and then crawls into a hole believing that nobody really cares about him anyway. This is the language of the warrior who has finally found that thing worth fighting for and worth dying for. This is the vocabulary of an evangelist who decides, this is all I'm going to talk about from now on. There's nothing else worth telling people but the good news about Jesus Christ. And everyone who has done that, these biblical characters, these historical characters inside of the church, they become these prophets and apostles who act as the foundation for the faith of billions because they decided he must increase and I must decrease. Let's pray.